Okay, so good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to our third online lecture. Uh, in the previous chapter, we were talking about the demand side of the market for final goods. And when we talk about the demand side, we are definitely talking about the consumer behavior. That's why we were uh, in the previous lecture or in the previous chapter discussing the theory of the consumer, uh, the consumer choice problem, and so on. Uh, in today's lecture, we are going to start talking about the supply side of the market for final commodities. And the supply here is represented by the producers. So we are going to study the behavior of the producers of final commodities. So let's agree that uh, any economy's ability to deliver the multitude of goods and services in its GDP depends upon this economy's productive capacity. And the productive capacity in any economy depends on a number of factors. First, of course, it's labor force. So the size of the labor force is an important factor that determines this economy's productive capacity. Not just the size of the labor force. So the quality of the labor force is a very important factor. And here we are talking about the level of education of our labor force, their health conditions, what we will be calling later on uh, human capital. Uh, another factor is the quantity and the quality of the capital stock in this economy. A third factor is the existence of natural resources and raw materials in this economy and the technical knowledge that exists in this economy. So, uh, do we have in economics any tool that could help us describe these productive capabilities? the productive capability of any economy? Yes, we have, uh, in what we call the production function. So what, is, what do we mean by a production function? A production function is a function that specifies the maximum output that can be produced with a given quantity of inputs for a given state of technical knowledge or technical know-how. So if we look at this equation, y, which is the, the level of output, okay, which will be the maximum level of output that can be produced, equal a function of, it is a function of the following factors or inputs to the production process, labor, capital, land, raw materials, and so on, okay, given a certain state of technical knowledge. So this is what we mean by a production function. So given a firm's production function, which is, as we agreed, the maximum level of output that can be produced given uh, a certain amount of inputs to the production process, we can then calculate three important production concepts. The first one is total product, the second one is marginal product, of course, as we uh, studied in uh, the consumer theory, we start with total utility and then we can derive marginal utility from the total utility. The same applies here in the theory of the producer. We will start by studying total product and then we will move to the marginal product, which as you all know, is the slope of the total product curve. Okay exactly as we studied in the consumer theory. And the third concept is average product. So given again, given a firm's production function, we can calculate three important production concepts, total product, marginal product, and average product. So let's start with total product. Total product is the total amount of output produced in physical units. Example, uh, number of laptops. How many laptops can be produced by this uh, firm, for example? Total product starts at zero for zero labor. So if this firm has not hired any labor yet, so its total product will be zero. 
So it is starting the curve, as you can imagine, will start from zero if we have on the x-axis labor and on the y-axis total product or the total amount of output produced in physical units. Okay, so it will start from the point of origin. Zero total product when we have zero labor. And then it's going to increase as additional units of labor are utilized or employed. Okay, until it reaches a maximum. The question is, this curve is increasing, but is it increasing by an increasing rate or is it increasing by a decreasing rate, okay, which is the slope of this curve. What is the slope of this curve? And since we are talking about the slope of the total product curve, this is what we call the marginal product as we will see in the next slide. So the marginal product, okay, is derived from the total product curve. It is the slope of the total product curve, okay, which is the changes in the total product when we change the amount of labor by one unit, as we will see next. So this graph shows us the total product curve. So we have on the x-axis uh, the number of labor employed. We have on the y-axis the total product or the total amount produced in physical units. As you can see, this is an increasing curve. Okay, So the first labor employed will result in total product uh, equal to 1,000. Okay, the second labor employed will result in total product becoming 3,000. Okay, the third labor employed will result in the total product becoming 3,500. So as you can see, the total product is increasing as we use more labor. But what is the rate of change? What is the slope of this curve? How does each extra unit of labor employed affect total product. It, what is the contribution of e each extra unit of labor to the total product? This is what we will study next under the term marginal product. So as you could have guessed by now, the marginal product uh, of an input, it is the extra output produced by each additional unit of that input. So we could talk about the marginal product of labor, the marginal product of capital, the marginal product of land, which is the extra output produced by each additional unit of that input, while keeping other inputs constant. This is very important. So in this case, we are assuming that all other inputs are kept constant and we are just changing the amount of one input so that we can be able to uh, calculate the marginal product of this input. For example, assume that we are holding land, machinery, and all other inputs constant, and we are just focusing on the marginal product of labor. So the marginal product of labor is the extra output obtained by adding one extra unit of labor. Okay, so it is, in other words, the contribution of labor to the total product, as we will see in the next graph of the marginal product. This is the uh, graph for marginal product of labor. So on the x-axis, we have the number of uh, units of labor employed. On the y-axis, we have the marginal product. So uh, just look at the gray bars. Okay, so this is like a bar chart. Uh, so as you can see, the first unit of labor employed, okay, its contribution to total product was 2,000. So this is the marginal product of the first unit of labor employed. What about the second unit of labor employed? Its contribution to total product was just 1,000. Okay. What about the third unit of labor employed? Its contribution to total product was just 500. So as you can see, the more we use of labor, okay, the 
less the contribution of each extra unit of labor employed to total product. That's why if we connect these bars together, okay, and if we want to form uh, a curve out of this, the curve will be downward sloping curve reflecting the what we will call later the, dimin the law of diminishing returns, okay, which is the law of decreasing marginal product of labor as we use more of labor. Third important concept is average product. You all know how we can calculate any average. So it is equal to total product divided by total number of units of the input employed. Okay, so if you look at this table, uh, in the first column we have the units of labor of input. Okay, uh, it starts from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And then the second column shows us the total product. So when, as we said, the total product curve, it starts from the point of origin. So it is equal to 0 when there is no labor employed. Okay. Uh, and then for the first unit of labor employed, the total product becomes 2,000. For the second unit of labor employed, the total product jumps to 3,000, and so on and so forth. The third column will show us the marginal product. So what is the marginal product? What is, what is the contribution of the first unit of labor employed? It is 2,000. What about the contribution of the second unit of labor employed? It is only 1,000. What about the contribution of the third unit of labor employed? It is 500. So as you can see, the contribution of each extra unit of labor employed is decreasing. That's why the marginal product curve was a downward sloping curve. What about the average product? The average product will be the total product divided by the number of labor employed. So when there is only one unit of labor employed, the average product will be 2,000 divided by 1 equal to 1,000. When there are two units of labor employed, the average product is equal to the total product, which is 3,000, divided by 2, which is 1,500, and so on. The law of diminishing returns. OK, so uh, I mentioned this law when I showed you the downward sloping marginal product curve which is very similar to the law of diminishing marginal utility. So the law of diminishing returns, or it can be called the law of diminishing marginal product, okay? Under this law, a firm will get less and less extra output when it adds additional units of an input while holding other inputs fixed. In other words, the marginal product of each unit of input will decline as the amount of that input increases holding all other inputs constant. So it is very important to remember that all other inputs are held constant. And actually, this will be the justification for why we are having this law of diminishing returns. So the idea behind this law is the following. As more labor is added to a fixed amount of land and machinery, the labor has less and less of these factors to work with. For example, the land gets more crowded as I add more labor to it. The machinery gets overworked and exhausted. Uh, and this is why the marginal product of labor declines. So again, we are having this law of diminishing returns or this law of diminishing marginal product of labor, for example. Why? Because we are holding all other inputs to the production process fixed. We are holding land fixed, a certain uh, size of land. We are holding machinery fixed, and we are just changing the amount of labor employed. So as you can imagine, as more and more labor is employed to a fixed piece of land, okay, it will, this piece of land will get overcrowded, okay, uh, which will decrease the uh, capability of labor to work on this overcrowded land. The machinery will get overworked, which will also result in uh, a declining uh, productivity of labor. Okay, So it is because of this 
uh, idea of holding other inputs to the production process fixed, that's why we are having this law of diminishing returns of law or law of diminishing marginal product of labor. Okay, and it is shown as a downward sloping marginal product curve of labor. So these two uh, graphs illustrate the, the law of diminishing returns for labor. So if we look at the graph on the left hand side, this is the graph of the total product. Okay, so we have on the x axis labor, an increasing amount of labor, and on the y axis we have the total product. As you can see, this is an increasing curve. However, it is increasing by a decreasing rate, okay, which means that its slope keeps decreasing. The curve is getting flatter and flatter as we move to the right, which means that the contribution of each extra unit of labor is declining. That's why this curve is a concave curve. So our total product curve is normally a concave curve, okay, reflecting the law of diminishing returns for labor. And if we look at the graph on the right hand side, this is the graph for the marginal product of labor, okay, which reflects the contribution of each extra unit of labor, or which reflects the slope of the total product curve. And as we agreed, it is a declining curve reflecting this law of diminishing marginal product of labor. Can you think of real world applications to the uh, law of diminishing marginal product of labor? Yes, of course, we have a very good example. Uh, I'm not sure if you experienced this or not yet, but uh, if you go to Mugamma al Tahrir, for example, you will find that uh, in an office there are like many employees. Okay, so here we are having more and more labor, okay, working in a fixed area. Okay, so we are holding all other inputs fixed and we are just adding the number of employees. Okay, so as you can imagine, the marginal product of each extra employee will be declining. Why? Because at the beginning, the employee, each employee had a desk. But as we add more and more employees, okay, employees will be sharing, more than one employee will be sharing the same desk. So we'll end up uh, having employees fighting instead of working, okay, which will result in a declining marginal product of labor. This is what we call in the public sector this disguised unemployment. Okay, I will al batal al muqanna why? Because uh, although people are working or supposed to be working, actually they are not working and their productivity is declining. Why? Because there is a fixed area for the office and we keep hiring or employing more and more labor to, to this fixed area. Okay. A second good example is uh, related to our microeconomics uh, and the way you should be studying microeconomics. As I told you in the first lecture, you should start uh, studying from the first day. Okay. And do not uh, keep uh, or leave uh, studying till the day before the exam because the, your marginal productivity will be declining. The marginal productivity of each studying hour will be declining. Okay, this is also related to the uh, law of diminishing marginal productivity. Uh, note that uh, in some cases the very first inputs of labor might actually show increasing marginal product. This is where a specific number of labor may be needed. However, diminishing returns will kick in afterwards. So what do I mean by this? Let's take an example. Suppose that after you graduate, uh, you decided to open an economic consulting office. 
so in this office okay in order to be able to deliver economic advice to different industries to whoever okay at least you need one economist working in this office you need uh, one political scientist for example in order to assess the political situation in the country and so on okay you will definitely need an accountant to take care of all the accounts of the office okay uh, you will definitely need someone to work in the kitchen, okay, to provide the workers with uh, coffee, tea, and so on, okay? So this means that these four uh, units of labor are very much needed for this uh, office to work efficiently, okay? Which means that hiring the first economist, okay, will be very important it will have a good contribution to the total product of this office okay hiring a second unit of labor who will be the political scientist will even contribute more to the uh, out to the advice or the technical advice coming out of this office okay so his marginal product will be higher okay than the, the first one because both are needed okay the third uh, labor employed who will who is the accountant is also needed so his marginal product will also be higher okay so this is the case where each additional unit of labor okay will be adding a lot to the total product of this uh, office okay however after these four any other unit of labor employed will be adding to the total product of this office but at a decreasing rate how will this be reflected in the total product curve the total product curve will be at the beginning increasing by an increasing rate okay as we add the first the second the third and the fourth unit of labor okay so it will be a convex curve and then it will shift to be a concave curve after the fourth unit of labor okay so we will have a total product curve that looks as follows a convex curve at the beginning and then it will shift to be a concave curve afterwards okay how will this be reflected in the marginal product curve at the beginning for the first units of labor employed we will have a marginal product curve that is increasing and then it will be decreasing after the fourth unit of labor employed We are going to move to another important concept in the theory of the producer which is returns to scale so when we started talking about total product marginal product and average product okay we made a very important assumption which is that all other inputs are held constant and we are just changing one input to the production process and that's why we had as a result of this the law of diminishing returns or the law of diminishing marginal product of labor for example if this is the factor we are changing but what if we want to examine the effect of increasing all inputs at the same time so we're not going to hold some inputs constant and changing just one input no now we are going to examine increasing all inputs at the same time so what would happen for example to wheat production if land labor water and other inputs were all doubled at the same time this is what we call returns to scale three important cases should be distinguished under returns to scale the first one is constant returns to scale from its name this is the case where a change in all inputs leads to a proportional change in output for example if labor land capital and other inputs are doubled then output would also double so it is constant returns to scale okay if I double all inputs output will also double what could be a good example for this many handcraft industries show constant returns to scale like pottery for example uh, like uh, knitting uh, uh, 
الخياطه يعني فور اكزامبل اف اي هاف ا نيتنج اندستري اند اي هاف وان ليدي هو از دوينج ذا ورك اوكي اند ام جيفينج هير ا نيدل فور اكزامبل اند شي از دوينج نيتنج اوكي اف اي هايرد انذر ليدي اند اي جوت هير انذر سيت اوف نيدلز اوكي سو the total product will double. So here I doubled all inputs to the production process, which are the, the labor employed and the, the equipment, which, are, which is the needle, okay? And I find out that the total product will just double, okay? So this is the case of constant returns to scale. The second type of returns to scale is increasing returns to scale, or what is also called economies of scale. So here, an increase in all inputs leads to a more than proportional increase in the level of output. So for example, doubling all inputs to the production process will lead to more than doubling the level of output produced. So what's the reason behind this? Why could we have, in some cases, increasing returns to scale this is because the larger scale of operation allows the following advantages when uh, an industry operates at a large scale of operation okay that's why we call it economies of scale or اقتصاديات الحجم الكبير when an industry operates under a large scale of operation it is allowed the following advantages the first thing is that workers will be allowed to specialize in their tasks. Okay? Thus, each one of these labor will be doing his work efficiently because specialization and division of labor will result in everyone working efficiently. The second advantage is that a large scale of operation will allow the use of more sophisticated equipment. And this, of course, will have a positive impact on the level of output produced. A third advantage of large scale of operation is investment on an R&D department, research and development department. So only big industries are capable of having an R&D department. And this R&D department will be specialized in uh, doing research, uh, trying to innovate the products uh, the, this industry is producing, uh, looking for technological advances, okay? Uh, and all this will have, of course, a positive impact on the level of output produced. That's why, in these cases, doubling inputs will result in more than doubling the level of output produced. A good example here is the car assembly line. The third type of returns to scale is decreasing returns to scale. This occurs when an increase of all inputs leads to a less than proportional increase in total output. For example, in this case, doubling inputs will result in less than a double of the total output. Why could this be the case? Because sometimes scaling up the, the level of industry may eventually reach a point beyond which inefficiencies set in. So actually what happens is that uh, an industry could start expanding. At the beginning, it faces constant returns to scale, and then further expansions will make it enter a region where increasing returns to scale will start happening, after which okay, a further expansion in the level of the industry, extra uh, doubling or tripling of the size of the inputs, might end up uh, with uh, less than proportional increase in the total output, where the industry starts facing decreasing returns to scale. These might arise because the costs of management or control become huge that the firm cannot afford. For example, suppose that a supermarket has one branch in the capital, in Cairo, for example, and in pursuit of greater profits, this supermarket decided to open more branches in different governorates in Egypt. Okay? Here we find that less time, the, 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 the management has less time to study each market. 
and uh, to spend on each decision taken in each governorate. So top managers will end up becoming insulated or isolated from day-to-day -day production and they start making mistakes. That's why this is when the firm will start facing decreasing returns to, to scale. Now we will move to another concept in the theory of the producer, which is the short run and the long run. So production requires not only labor, capital, land, but also it requires time. So plants cannot be built overnight. And once they are built, they last for decades. Farmers cannot change crops in mid-season. It takes time for a farmer to decide to change the crop. Okay, that's why time is important in the production process. And here we have to differentiate between the short run and the long run. So what is the difference between the short run and the long run? The short run, أو المدى القصير, it is the period of time in which only variable inputs like labor can be adjusted. This means that in the short run, there are some inputs which are called fixed inputs, fixed in their supply, such as plant, the size of the plant, equipment. These are fixed inputs because they cannot be fully adjusted in the short term. So in the short run, there are some variables that we call variable inputs. Okay, uh, These variables we can change in a very short time period, we can hire more labor, okay, at a very short time period. However, there are other factors that are fixed in supply. We cannot ch change their quantity in a very short period of time. And it takes time to build a new plant. It takes like months to, to build a new plant. It takes time to import new equipment, okay? It's not done overnight. That's why in the short term, we have to differentiate between variable inputs that can be changed immediately and fixed inputs that we have to stick with their size for the short term. What about the long run? The long run is the period in which all factors employed by the firm, including capital okay, and plant size, can be changed. So this is the main differentiation between the short run and the long run. In the short run, we have variable inputs and fixed inputs. In the long run, okay, all variables can be changed. So in the long run, we do not have any more fixed inputs because we had enough time to be able to change all the uh, inputs to the production process. So let's take an example, a real life example, in order to uh, clarify this. Uh, idea of the short run and the long run. If you remember, uh, the government a few years ago launched this 1 million apartment project. Okay. This at that time led to an unexpected increase in the demand for steel. At that time. What do you think was the response of the steel industry facing this huge increase in the demand? So in the short run, the steel industry facing this very high demand for its steel, okay, was able only to increase production by increasing the number of shift, shifts for its workers, okay, and by hiring more workers. This is what it can only do in the short run, just changing its variable input, which is the number of labor employed, okay. What about the long-run decision of the steel industry? If the steel industry felt that this demand for its steel will persist for a number of years, okay, it will start thinking today of uh, expanding its production in the long run by building uh, another plant, for example. Okay, So it will start today thinking or planning for the long run by starting to build a new plant and this will 
uh, be in effect only in the long run when the new plant will be built. I'm going to move to another concept, which is technological progress, or a tattooed technology. Under this concept, we have two types of technological progress. It is either process innovation, tattooed في العملية الإنتاجية in the process production process itself, or product innovation, tattooed في المنتج النهائي. So let's start with process innovation. Process innovation, or uh, progress in the production process itself. It occurs when new engineering knowledge improves the production techniques for existing pro products. For example, a process innovation allows firms to produce more output with the same level of inputs. This is called process innovation, which allows the firm to produce more output with the same level of inputs. Or it could lead to the production of the same level of output, but with fewer number of units of inputs needed. Okay? This is another form of process innovation. In other words, a process innovation will lead to a shift in the total product curve, or what we call the production function, as we see next. So what do we have on this graph? Uh, on this graph, we have the total product curve, Okay, which is uh, the, the gray curve. We have on the x-axis uh, one of the inputs used in the production process, let's say labor, for example. On the y-axis, we have the total product. Uh, and this total product curve, which is the gray curve, this reflects the production function in this industry. Okay, so uh, what, will happen, what will happen if there is technological progress? We said that technological progress could lead to uh, more level of output produced from the same uh, number of units of input employed, okay? Or it could lead to uh, same level of output employed using a uh, lower number of inputs, okay? So let's look at the first case. If we... Uh, stick to one unit of labor employed, okay? According to the uh, old technology, which is the gray curve, 1995 technology, okay? This one unit of labor was able to produce 2,000 units of total product, okay? However, with the new technology, the 2005 technology, which is the red dotted curve, okay? This one unit of labor can produce 3,000 units of total product. So this is what we call by technological progress. The same number of units uh, employed okay, can result in a higher level of output. That's why uh, it was reflected in a shift in the total product curve or a shift in the production uh, function, an upward shift, or for, uh, of course. Okay? Or we can look at, at it from the other uh, side. Let's start with... Uh, 2,000 units of output produced, okay? Uh, the old technology will produce this 2,000 using one unit of labor. But if we look at the new technology, it will require just half unit of labor to produce the same level of output, okay? Again, this is reflected by the upward shift in the total product curve or in the production function. The second outcome of technological progress is product innovation. So, as we said, technological progress can either lead to process innovation, innovation in the production process itself, or it can lead to product innovation. This occurs when new products are introduced in the marketplace. Many of today's goods and services, for example, did not exist 50 years ago. If we look at the whole spectrum of internet services like WhatsApp, online shopping, uh, the email system, Facebook, our current e-learning, okay? These were not found even in science fiction movies 30 years ago. So all these are the product of technological progress.
another very important measure of economic performance is productivity okay it's a very important measure of or economic performance so productivity is a concept that measures the ratio of output to inputs we have different uh, measures of productivity we have labor productivity labor productivity will measure output per unit of labor okay such as the number of hours worked for example so if we divide my output by the number of hours I worked okay this will give my labor productivity we could also have total factor productivity from its name it's it is output divided by an index of all inputs all inputs together labor capital raw materials okay we can collect them together in one variable that we call an index of all inputs okay and by dividing output by this index we will get the total factor productivity when output is growing faster than this index of all inputs this represents productivity growth okay and this is a very important measure that differentiates developed countries from developing countries okay it is the growth in the level of productivity so what makes productivity grow what leads to this concept of productivity growth actually there are three factors that could lead to uh, growth in the level of productivity of labor for example productivity the first factor is technological advances okay as we saw in the previous graph technological advances leads to an upward shift in the total product curve okay so technological advances leads to productivity growth the second very important factor that leads to productivity growth is the level of human capital the level of education of the labor force the level of health of the labor force all this leads to uh, productivity growth of labor for example uh, a third factor is economies of scale okay if you remember economies of scale or increasing returns to scale this idea of specialization in production division of labor all this leads to uh, growth in uh, labor productivity for example fourth factor that leads to productivity growth is what we call economies of scope so what do we mean by economies of scope this occurs when a number of different products can be produced more efficiently together than apart let's look at this example and it will clarify the concept for you if we look at dina farms for example okay dina farms dina that we find in the supermarket okay so dina farms they started by producing only milk okay skimmed milk and uh, full uh, fat milk uh, and then they are now producing yogurt as well okay uh, and then they they also started producing cheese so it is this specialization in production okay uh, that enabled them to uh, produce different products okay efficiently together which is better than uh, every uh, firm uh, just focusing on just one product like one firm producing only milk another firm only producing yogurt a third firm producing cheese because these products are related to some extent together okay so economies of scale uh, of scope means that uh, one firm can produce different products that are related okay more efficiently than if these products are produced separately this is the idea of economies of scope and which leads to uh, productivity growth this is the 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 last thing that uh, we had in the theory of the firm okay and uh, this is all what I had to tell you in chapter 6 uh, for
hope you uh, find it easy. It has many concepts uh, similar to the concepts that we studied in the theory of the consumer. Okay, uh, so I hope you found it uh, easy. And uh, if you have any questions, you can just send me an, e an email. Okay.